One day, Ashley called me, said, look, there's this studio that's got a vacancy. So, you know, why don't you go for an interview, see if you can get a job, an independent little studio. He said, there's only two questions you need to know the answer to. And he said, look, one of the questions going to be is, uh, what hobbies do you have? And the answer is none. The other question is going to be, what sort of music do you like? And the answer is everything. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Vance Powell, Glenn Rosenstein, Michael Wagner, Ray Kennedy, Buddy Miller, John McBride, and Alan Parsons. What do all these rock stars have in common other than that they should be on this podcast? They all have something great to say about Mike Tech microphones. Check out Mike Tech Audio at M-I-K-T-E-K-Audio.com slash artists. Hey, rock stars, it's your host, Lid Sean. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars, bringing you into the studio to learn from recording professionals so that you can make your best record ever and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is someone who has been suggested by more of my previous guests than any other producer or engineer. At nearly 100 episodes into the podcast, I am absolutely thrilled to have Richard Dodd finally on the show today, a multi-platinum Grammy-winning producer, recording engineer, and mastering engineer with 40 years of amazing credits to his discography. Richard began recording hits in the 1970s like Kung Fu Fighting and has since distinguished himself many times over while working with artists like Boz Skaggs, Stefan Grappelli, George Harrison, Clanad, Roy Orbison, Wilco, Green Day, Steve Earle, Delbert McClinton, Robert Plant, Roger Daltrey, The Traveling Wilburys, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers, Freddie Mercury, Placido Domingo, and many, many more. In 1995, he won the Best Engineer Grammy Award for Tom Petty's Wildflowers, Best Blues Album in 2001 for Nothing Personal by Delbert McClinton, and multiple Grammys in 2007 for the Dixie Chicks, Taking the Long Way. While in the country market, Richard has mastered all of Jason Aldean's platinum albums, plus all 13 of Jason's number one hit singles. His career has taken him through recording, mixing, producing, and mastering, so he has seen all genres as versus blues, Celtic, orchestral, and pop, and he takes pride in bringing a consistent musicality and honesty to every project he takes on. Fortunately for us rock stars, Richard has a lot to teach us and lives right here in Nashville, Tennessee, and was able to join me from his studio here in Berry Hill. Please welcome Richard Dodd to Recording Studio Rock Stars. Richard, my friend, <laughs> my very patient friend, are you ready to rock? Absolutely. Welcome to our show. <laughs> awesome, man. So, um, you know, we don't have to go into it, but rock stars, just know that Richard and I have put in some serious effort just to get this podcast rolling today. It's one of those uh, Murphy's Laws, I think, yeah. that says that when you finally have Richard Dodd on your podcast, your computer will absolutely refuse to start up, and then you'll find out that you have the wrong driver and you've updated and, and your software is not working. But we've persevered, and uh, fortunately... As I said, we're in Richard's studio, and it turns out that Richard is able to record things in his studio. Yeah, it's really fortunate. You know, when I found the right hole in the patch bay, we were ready to rock, you know. Um, uh, well, yeah, yeah I, won't, I won't do a, a, you know, any, any uh, tasteless joke to that. But the um, question I wanted to ask you was, I, I gave you an intro here, but can you tell us in your own words, you know, how, how'd you get into this mess of recording? Um, I started in the music business, as it were, when I was at high, in high school, in uh, Stopsley High School in, in England, uh, in a band with uh, a couple of friends. And uh, we decided that when we left school, we would somehow be doing this professionally. And of course, that didn't happen. However, the father of one of these guys uh, worked at a aircraft manufacturing company called British Aircraft Corporation and they took on apprentices and they did electronics which is kind of close to recording and we'd made our own album in my friend's bedroom on a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine. Just like a live to two track kind of thing? Well actually it had two tracks and um, it was a Simon and his father was very very clever. He had bought the optional stereo 
modification. And uh, that included two track. So we had the facility of recording on one track and then adding to it as we jumped to another track. Nice. Oh, right. So the whole, so my generation was the double cassette deck. Mm -hmm. So you'd record on one cassette and then you'd plug in a microphone and, and layer that as you bounce it over to the other cassette. But you're doing the same thing by bouncing from track to track? Yeah, with seven and a half on quarter inch tape. And um, because his dad was a technician, he bought a machine which had controls on the front that had this sort of like scientific names like bias and erase, you know, like, wow, you know, you knew you didn't want to touch erase because who wants to erase anything? Right. But, but bias, now what, I didn't know what it meant. Neither of us knew what it meant. But when we listened back, if we had changed the bias, the sound was different. Mm. And so we'd remember that to the left, it would be brighter and a bit more distorted, more distorted when, when we played it back. And to the right, it was duller, but uh, apparently less distorted. Right. Um, so we were over-biasing and under-biasing without knowing it. And uh, so that was fun, especially if you were feeding back one track to another and, uh, you know, it'd either go off into the ether or just bubble away, you know. <laughs> um, but um, we recorded our album. Uh, <laughs> And uh, at the same time, Peter actually, Peter, who was the guy whose father had the tape machine, Peter applied for a job at the company that his father ran the most of. And uh, he didn't get the job there, but I did. So I went to work in the factory that his father was head of one of the departments. And Peter got a job in London through his uncle working at CBS Studios which at that time were in New Bond Street and then Theobald's Road. As we all do, gophers, you know. Right. So the third member of our band decided that if Peter can get a job in a studio, so can he. So he did the right thing. He wrote to every studio, got no replies. Uh, so he phoned every studio and was hung up on <laughs> and then tried the thing that obviously worked for him, which is knock on every door. And he happened to knock on the door of one studio, uh, Lansdowne in Holland Park, which is only recently demised, as it were, gone, um, met its demise. And uh, they just fired somebody. So Ashley, the name of the other third person, he uh, was hired on the spot. Uh, he found himself working with bands like Uriah Heep, heavy metal bands, and, and working during the day with all the session guys and everything. And we were obviously still in touch. Uh, he would say, you know, why don't you come up on a Friday night, get on the train, come up to London, hang around, and then after the band's finish, we can play with the gear, you know, totally against all the Yeah, rules. right. And so we did. You know, and uh, But totally a whole lot of fun. Oh, you wouldn't believe it. Especially as I'd go up on a Friday night and, and you're right, he would finish about 2 a.m., something like that, which left Ash and me to mess with their takes so being frustrated musicians ourselves we would um, go to the guitar solos and just mix the guitar solos from all the songs which were virtually all in the same key anyway you know now these are uh, clients songs and things oh absolutely like that. Yeah. yeah but we were very careful <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, won't, uh, I will neither deny nor uh, um, <laughs> admit that I have ever done the same thing in exactly. a studio exactly well, we're so ignorant that we didn't realize actually that we were doing anything wrong or even potentially dangerous. Uh, come to think, uh, when I think back, that uh, their eight-track masters were on a Scully tape machine. And mm -hmm. anybody that's worked a Scully tape machine will know that you you were taking your life in your hands. Like every Re time you played the tape, yeah. Rewinding was potentially the end of the session. You know? Yeah. But um, it was those are the tapes. It was like a Sergeant Pepper somebody. Something like that. <laughs> well, they, they did do, yeah, but most of their stuff is changing subject. And thankfully to the Beatles, um, Sergeant Pepper was mostly done on Studer J37 one-inch four tracks. Oh, okay, interesting. Right, right, Which right. set the tape handling standard. You know, the Scully was an American machine, which is more, this works, so we'll use that, you know, rather than... Anyway, they had a situation of keeping tension when an arm would come out against the tape and would vary in accordance to what was needed yeah. to keep a constant tension. 
That was sort of the introduction of yeah. the flange arm. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a, and it's a mechanical feedback system that would operate yeah. an electrical thing. It didn't always work fast enough to catch the situation, and so sometimes it could go too far out, and instead of just being uh, that being the maximum travel, it would also sometimes switch off one of the motors. <laughs> wow. So you had one spool going at mm, a thousand miles an hour and the other one stopped. What happens when that happens? Uh, it's like a parade. You know, there's tape everywhere. Really? It just goes, it just snaps and flies. Well, all it doesn't always time. snap, but it certainly flies. <laughs> yeah. But um, anyway, that's what could have happened. Fortunately for us, it never did. Yeah. And we would mix down to quarter inch tape. Then we decided to edit them all together so we could make like a three minute guitar solo. You know, which was fantastic, which in itself is great, except for technically is a little boring. So we decided to turn some bits backwards and uh, we learned how to do tape phasing. So we'd phase some stuff, you know, obviously EQ it, add reverb and yeah. do all that. Just generally mess it around. Music concrete. Right? Yeah. Uh, and of course, neither of us had a tape machine at home worth anything. Uh, Ashley had an old Grundig, which maximum speed was three and three quarters, and the professional studio's slowest speed was seven and a half. Right. So we had to work out a way of doing that. Well, and rock stars, I'm sorry, I refer to our listeners mm. as the rock stars, but uh, rock stars, uh, even at seven and a half, that was already slow compared to, you know, 15 ips and 30 ips for, for the pro speeds of stuff. I will say that seven and a half sounds awesome. It does. Really sounds good. Yes, it's, it's a very, what they say, what the kids today say, fat yeah, sound. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Sounds like you're making dubstep. Or not dubstep, dub music. Like, Yeah, it's really good. So uh, before we leave the, the topic of tape, can you give us three uh, stories of just terrible things you've seen happen with tape? Like just tape disasters? Sure. What I'm going to do is finish that other story. Oh, yeah, they sorry, are, sorry. No, no, I'll get to that. So basically, we'd mess around in the studio. One day, Ashley called me at my job, which wasn't allowed for me to receive calls. But anyway, I got this call. He said it was urgent. And he said, uh, somebody here is leaving. Do you want to have a job here? You know, So, or that's what I thought he said. Turns out that the engineer, one of the engineers, assistant engineers at, at Lansdowne where Ashley worked, had been offered a job at another studio as a second engineer, tape up as we call them. And he turned it down because he was about to be promoted to engineer. But he did mention that he knew somebody that might be interested because we'd met past in the night, as it were. And uh, so Ashley said, look, there's this studio that's got a vacancy. So, you know, why don't you go for an interview, see if you can get a job, an independent little studio. So uh, we discussed the possibility. So I thought, what could it hurt? So I took a day off and I mean, arranged for an interview and took a day off. And Ashley and my friend Peter, who were both in the business then, said, look, you know, you're going to ask you loads of questions and I'm worried about what technical questions they're going to ask me and what I should know and all that sort of stuff. He said, but well, they both said, there's only two questions you need to know the answer to. So I'm waiting for this insight into technology. And he said, look, one of the questions going to be is, uh, what hobbies do you have? And the answer is none. You know, the other question is going to be, what sort of music do you like? And the answer is everything. Nice. <laughs> so basically, you're available 24-7, 365 to do anything. That's all they're interested in. Yeah. And in some form, those two questions came up. I got the job. And then I had to get out of my indentured apprenticeship, which is another long story, which yeah. I did. And uh, I was in. Nice. And so you, in your first job with the airline company or manufacturer, you had begun to learn electronics and you began to Supposedly, be exposed to that? Yeah. Supposedly, okay. Yeah, except... Um, the first year was mechanical engineering, you know, milling, grinding, turning, right. that sort of stuff, which right. was great, actually. And very little. The only bit of electronics we did was how to uh, tie multiple wires together neatly, you know, wrap them. Important stuff yeah. for, for looms and, and building And the best studios. one, the most memorable one, was soldering. Oh, good, yeah. Because this company made missiles, and so it's military spec, and... Military spec was no edges to your solder. So if you had a leg coming through the board, uh, the solder that attached to the circuit board would form a dome. There would be no protruding metal. You'd only have solder. Interesting. And the way they tested 
that you'd done it up to standard wasn't visually. You would present your work to the instructor. The, re- the instructor would invite you to hold your hand out, palm up. <laughs> and he would proceed to run the soldered side of the board across your hand. If there was no blood, you'd done it correctly. Wow. I actually did a little bit of work in my studio with somebody who was helping to solder, and he had learned in the military, and, and it was pretty remarkable. You know, he was very, very vigilant about the whole process and being very careful. Yeah. Well, the other lesson I learned in that environment that stays with me, that is, that has been most helpful to me in my what was then to be career, was I was given the job of taking a, a piece of scrap metal and manufacturing a perfect cube from that piece of scrap metal. So you had to learn billing and how to set things up. And to and it was gauged to a thousandth of an inch yeah. of accuracy. And all angles had to be within sort of like tenth of a degree or something. You know, so it's a cube. So, you know, there you go. You're given one measurement and then... So I finished my job and as I was taking it from the mill, I forgot to raise the cutting head high enough and I accidentally caught one face of the cube on the cutting tool which put a little scratch on it. So I took it up anyway and he measured it with his micrometer and measured all the angles and they were all you know well within spec so I thought I'm pretty good you know I checked it obviously I knew it was and he said fail. So I said but it's he said he said but the drawing doesn't call for a scratch. <laughs> nice. He said, so it, you failed. So I said, well, what if I get rid of the scratch? He said, well, the scratch, he said, is about three or four thousandths of an inch deep. He said, and if you go take that down three or four thousandths, he said, you'll be undersized and you will fail. So that so, was it, huh? So I was a failure. So he said, he said, but you've got 10 minutes left if it's something you want to think about. So I said, well, what can I do? I can't take it down. He said, well, the drawing didn't call for a scratch. He said, what finish did the drawing call for? So I'm looking at the specs. I said, uh, I don't see one. He goes, well, there's something to think about then. So I said, well, what can I do? He said, well, you have a scratch. He said, if that scratch were an elephant, he said, where would you hide that scratch? Where would you hide that elephant? So go and think about it. Where do you hide an elephant? Yeah. Well, the answer is, not to keep you all in suspense, is in a herd of elephants. Right. So I went back and I applied a brush finish to all the surfaces. You put some wire wool in. So it's just a series of very, very faint scratches. Yeah. Which, and I took it back to him and he goes through the measuring procedure and of course, you know, most of it is up to still the same size, just some of it is now. So he measures it out and he said, uh, you passed, he said, but I can't give you 100%. He said, because there is no finish called for. He said, and you've interpreted that as any finish you want. He said, which you should have interpreted as no finish, but you pass. Nice. So... I know where to hide elephants. You know. <laughs> That's a, it's a great story. It's and and um, the, the finish and the scratch and hiding a scratch and a bunch of scratches, first thing that comes to mind for me is vinyl records yeah. and the sound of that. And, and, you know, a couple of pops here and there, you know, sort of stick out. But when it becomes part of the sort of the, yeah. the finish of the sound. I, I think the lesson you, you know. I'm learning, I learned from that was as I learned a phrase when I came to stay in America a lot was, you know, if you're given lemons, you make lemonade. Yeah. And where that came to me to be helpful is, is recording sometimes, with, you know, live, everything live, and you've got strings and timpani and tambourines and electric guitars, everything, all, everybody's on everybody's mic. You That tambourine bleed yeah. is everywhere. Yeah. And you can learn to make an option of, of not hearing the tambourine, but noticing the tambourine. And you can mentally say, yeah, the tambourine's cool. It's it's not a tam- mic'd tambourine, but the tambourine's there in enough to do the job, you know? So you don't have to fret about the fact that the tambourine's on everybody's mic. 
you just opt to choose to like the fact that the tambourine isn't close mic'd uh, or as close mic'd as you'd like it to appear to be and live with it, you know, move on. You make something of it and move on. Those sort of things don't apply so much today, of course, because we have so many options of faking it, replacing it, eliminating it. Yeah, but yeah. it's fun. Yeah. Well, it's interesting though because uh, obviously a takeaway is that you learned the value of attention to detail, and that's so critical, I think, in making records. And so often that's the thing that at first is lacking. Sure, and, and to a to a fault as well, because early on in my career, I um, when I was given the responsibility, I would always consider what I was being given as being it. And my job was to represent everything I was given in a hopefully acceptable, likable fashion. It took me a long while to realize that sometimes I could give more by removing some of the elements I was given or eliminate, you know, muting them temporarily or whatever. So that came a long time later. At first I was determined to there's 16 tracks of stuff or eight tracks of stuff, you know, we're going to hear it all. Yeah, and, yeah absolutely. And it, it served me well because I was good at that. And it's funny to think that, um, you know, comparatively speaking, today if you could get somebody to just narrow it down to eight tracks, that would have been them already muting a bunch of stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's... Uh, it's uh, but, um, yeah, so... You, you asked me another question, I, I think. About, oh, it was some tape stories. Tell yeah. us some terrible tape stories. All right, those are easy. Terrible tape tragedies. Here All they right. come, rock stars. So we're at uh, an independent studio, and we're typically using scotch tape, 3M scotch tape. And because it's an independent studio, the owners, who was also one of them, was also the studio manager, was always looking for a way to save some money. And buying cheaper tape but charging the same price was a great way of making more money. Yeah. It's pennies, but, you know, they're his pennies. And so we switched to Rakel Zonal Tape. A lot cheaper and gave me experiences I never would have thought I'd have had. For example, the multi-track tape. First major session on Rakel. I'm rewinding, having just... All the musicians there, we just take, they just want to come in and hear it back. As the tape machine's rewinding, I hear, K -k -k. strange. <laughs> Think nothing of it. So we commence to play back, and it gets to somewhere around about the second chorus, and it goes to absolute silence. By the time everybody's focused on everybody else, the music comes blasting back in. Then I realize what the K -k -k was during rewind when they're manufacturing tape on mass is not just one inch wide or two inches wide or whatever it's on a drum yes you know, many feet wide and it's cut to the required thing but of course those drums those rolls run out at some stage and so they to join two rolls together to continue the the run they use paper tape like you know scotch tape but made a sticky so yeah. what they'd done is they'd They'd made this roll and they, they hadn't bothered to have any quality control whatsoever. And they'd included this space on the tape of paper with no oxide or anything. So obviously silence. Again, uh, the same tape manufacturer, this time a little different. <laughs> they uh, were playing back and my habit was to always have my hands resting on the volume control just in case. Yeah. Good habit. Uh, well, that's, that's the one I had. And I felt that the track was losing its power for some reason. It wasn't as interesting. And the meters were going down a bit, the multi-track. So I edged up the monitor and I realized that I was fighting. It's like the music was fading out. And, you know, again, there's the looks around the room. And then the music started coming back again, you know. So I'm looking at the tape, everything seemed fine by the time I looked. Sorry, I turned my head from the mic there. Sorry. But everything seemed fine by the time I looked. And um, turns out, when I investigated, that that was a piece of tape that hadn't had any oxide applied to it. It just went completely translucent. Like imagine a hard drive just getting quieter in some sections. <laughs> yeah, that's not <laughs> going to happen, is it? Yeah. But um, yeah, it's, it's the equivalent of the tread 
gradually coming off your tire and then coming back again, you know, hopefully. But uh, the third one, quarter inch tape, break all zonal. And I was recording a mix. I played it back. We were on a C37, which is a quarter inch version of the studio that the Beatles used. And there was no, virtually no left hand channel. You know, it was good 10 dB quieter. So I thought that maybe the machine hadn't been aligned or as faulty. I went through the usual tests. Everything seemed to be fine. I put some echo tape, which was usually used tape that we use just to use as a delay to the echo plate and on the machine. And that seemed fine. But this new reel of tape wasn't. So just to triple check, I turned the tape over and the fault changed to the other side. So it's now indicating the fault lie on the tape. So I go to the maintenance guy and I explain to him that I've got a quarter inch tape that is 10 dB down on, dB down on one side. Well, I realized that I had more names than I got on my birth certificate because he called me everything under the sun. Yeah. You know, how could I be that stupid? It's not possible. You know, he's been in the business, you know, since tape was invented and, you know, it's, <laughs> it's never, you can't have a quarter inch tape that is 10 dB different on one track to another. Just can't happen. So I took him in and proved to him that it had happened. And courtesy of Rachel Zonal, <laughs> yeah. we both experienced something we hope we never experience again. Well, I'm glad that I've never had to use that particular brand of tape. I don't think that one's been around for a while, right? Yeah, well, you know, fortunately, I, I'm really pleased with that last one because the last one was the nail in the coffin. We went back to Scotch. Nice. I like to ask our guests at the beginning of the podcast for an inspirational quote. Do you have anything you want to share with us, Richard? Sure. I, I, I pretty much think everything you say is can, inspirational. Can I, can I quote somebody else? Yeah, absolutely. Del Newman. Del Newman is a, uh, a ranger producer has many famous credits, Rod Stewart, Elton John, Cat Stevens. Dell, in his early days of production, coincided with my early days of recording and mixing. And he asked me if I would teach him some technical stuff. You know, he was keen to learn about reverb. And he said, here's the specs for a cube. Bring it back to me. <laughs> so he said, and in return, he would you know, answer any, teach me about music and composition and arrangement and stuff. So I thought, wow, because he was also a qualified teacher. So we sat down on one occasion in our reduction suite, which is what our mix room was called, reducing That's many tracks to a couple. Suite. Reduction suite. Reduction room, actually. It was later called a suite, I think. But anyway, and I had a recorded cross stick, you know, just, and using an echo plate, I demonstrated to Dell the difference between putting a delay on the send to the plate and when that delay, how it changed, you know, doubled when you used seven and a half instead of 15 and then the time the plate was set to and that you could compress the send, you could compress the return, that you could actually use a spin echo, as we call it, you know, a regenerative delay to the plate, all those sorts of things and the effect of on this one cross stick that all those different things would do. And we'd do, then we'd do other look, more legato instruments, you know, typically more legato like strings and smoother stuff and vocals, of course, and how the S is. And, you know, I tried to show him all the things that I'd learned so far. And it came the time for him to reciprocate. You know, I remember three specific things. One it was simple, you know, what do you, what, what do you call it when, you know, there's a musical sound that sounds like something, you know, in nature or whatever, onomatopoeic, apparently. Yeah. You know, um, okay, well, that was, that was, a, that was an easy one. So I said, well, how about anything else? You know, you, you know everything about music. What should I know? What should I start to learn? He said, well, he said, the first thing you should learn in music is that the space between the notes are the most powerful elements in composition. So it's what they don't play 
that's really important, okay? He said, the only other thing you really need to know, Richard, is it's not, the sound doesn't matter. He said, it's the sound of the sound that matters. Interesting. So what does that mean? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Every so often, I go, thanks, Del. You know, I think I've got it now. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, it's, and it's an inspirational thing because really it's saying, you know, just don't sweat it. You know, it's going to be what it is. And that's what counts is, is what counts is if, if people starting with yourself love it, it's a great sound. Yeah. I mean, the number of things that have been on the top of the charts, which I've, I, I hands in the air admit I've said, that sounds like shit, you know, but it, it but I'm wrong because a hit sound is a great sound. You're right. Cause people like it. Hey, you know, you know, it's. Me being a snob, I don't like it for some reason. But if it's hit, it's great. But that now, really helps. What about the space between the notes? Can we use that as an excuse to never get around and getting around to writing our song or making our own album? No, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. <laughs> but where it can help us on the technical side rather than on the musical side is it brings us to the other, you know, a, another question: What's the most important element of? device that you have when you're mixing you know mm. uh that isn't emotional or psychological or anything and it's the mute button that's i'm, I'm glad to hear you say that i i've actually said that myself too and, and felt that but uh, yeah, there's, coming from you now it's legit <laughs> no no i mean but there are three major devices at our literally at our fingertips that will help you be the difference to somebody else if you if you can master three gadgets one of them as i've mentioned is the mute switch the other one's the mono button mm. and the third the most important of all is the talk back switch interesting you can communicate in a positive way with everybody else involved then the whole project's going to be elevated what i've discovered that what i could do by being silent or saying the right thing at the right time can completely change the project. Sometimes sustain a project that was about to die and sometimes in, you know, just encourage somebody to stop. <laughs> just, you've got it. You've, that's it. Let's move on. Yeah. Well, that's fascinating because after the mute button, my brain was thinking about the fader level and volume writing, but you make a great point, which is that, um, first of all, the mono button which I'll, I'll let you get into that, but the mono button is sort of, it's a preventative method to help us avoid screwing everything up because we've got this fancy stereo thing going on, right? Mm -hmm. And then the talkback switch is another preventative method so that, you know, by, by working with the artists and the musicians in such a way that they're empowered to create great sounds that sound great, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need to start trying to manipulate it with the volume knob as much. That's the, right. The fader, rather. That's right. I mean, unfortunately for me, I, from time to time, offer up words of wisdom, <laughs> <laughs> which aren't necessarily wise. They're sometimes just funny. I'm probably the yogi bearer of recording. <laughs> nice. <laughs> but um, th they're well-intentioned. And I actually understand everything yogi bearer said. <laughs> so there, there's a problem I have, too. But... Um, yeah, I, I, I once, a friend of mine, Don Washburn, who's, who works with SSL, yeah. as everybody knows, lovely man, he, we were talking and uh, he was complimenting me on something I'd done apparently. And my response, which was quite legit, I hadn't thought it through, was, yeah, I, I didn't get in the way of that one. Yeah, it's so easy for us to get too involved in what we do and impose changes that not that aren't necessarily bad, but sometimes completely irrelevant and very often unnecessary, just because we can. Mm -hmm. You know, I find myself especially working in the digital domain, you know, when I'm mixing, being a little scientist, you know, because I can, because I can. There's a lot of stuff we can do in there. There's so much I can do, you know. I was never able to do that. But uh, 
fun, funny somehow you know sergeant pepper at the moment is very in the news you know yeah as it should be yeah and they managed to do loads of stuff that couldn't be done yeah until they did them it's like jack bannister I mean, no one could possibly run a mile in four minutes until someone did right you know and then everybody that wants to can so it's important for me to try and restrict myself into doing only what is necessary it, obviously in my opinion it's difficult to do that yeah. you know because the drawback of having had all of the experience i've had for me i'm not saying this is going to be relevant to any other listeners but i sometimes find myself hearing the result of the thing i'm about to do before i've done it and i even decide to not do it you know um and sometimes i think i've done it you know because just i i can hear what's going to happen when i've selected that frequency that amount on that instrument wow. to dip or cut i know what's going to happen so i don't know whether i'm just thinking out loud now but that's one of the processes that i find myself going through is like no no, no that's that's too much <laughs> I, mean, right, right. I haven't even done it yet you know and i already know it's too much well i imagine a drawback is that it uh, prevents you from having the experience of going and stumbling on something unexpected which is a valuable part of the creative process, right? It is. It's a tre tremendous part. And anybody that hasn't yet got the experience, you can try that at home, folks. Just bring your files into a session you've already finished. <laughs> right. You know, just, it's, I'm not saying use presets, but just see what happens when you introduce something that you've heard a thousand times maybe because of overdubs into a situation you've not yet experienced settings from another session for your for your drum kit or whatever and then i mean completely wrong for this but you might learn one thing that either is good or definitely never do that again and uh you, that's that's experience well now that used to happen a little more regularly in the studio right because yeah, the console was set up for a mix on the last yeah. song and then and the someone tape just goes to yeah. the next song right yeah if somebody hadn't uh, strip you know zeroed the console you know, and in some cases, some some younger engineers would, you know, str struggle to see. You know, I'll I'll reset the console for you because they wanted to see what the guy had done. <laughs> you know, to copy, and but that's that's the way we all do it. We all copy somebody else. You know, yeah. and hopefully, you know, change it, improve it, add to it. You know, a bit of Fred, a bit of Bernie, and out comes you. You know. Well, now share a tip with the rock stars about how you go about making sure you don't do too much to stuff and get in the way of it. Are there any ways of working or ways of thinking that you've adapted that help you check yourself in that process? Yes. Uh, the one I employ the most is that I hate what I do. I know that I'm useless and totally incompetent. And so consequently, I know that other than what I've done already, there's a better way. Right. And that better way usually is don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. The analogy uh, of the older days would be pull all the faders down, switch the EQ out, unplug the compressors, start again. Right. Which is very quick to do. You know. It's quicker than doing it in a computer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. But on the other hand, today, what you can do safely is save as... <laughs> And start again. Yeah. And even more beautifully, import what you've previously done into what you're now doing, mm -hmm. which is all wonderful stuff. I love the challenges of today's working environment. It's a great time to be a geek, isn't it? It is. It's really good. And it's turned me into a geek that obviously was dormant anyway. But um, yeah, being forced to learn about things that otherwise I wouldn't. I believed I could even begin to comprehend, which is a whole other subject because I don't really know very much. But um, I have an ability of understanding anything. You know, it may not be the scientifically accepted method, but I know. But if you can feel good about it, you understand. Sure. For me, it's uh, the, for example, a magician doing a trick doesn't entertain me, 
because I just sit there and work out a way that that could be done. <laughs> and once I have, for me, a way that that could be done, I'm done. Right, right. I have no interest in learning how they did it. Right. As long as I could figure out how I would do it. You know? Well, I'll have to remember to invite you to our next birthday party then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> well, so Richard, um, there's so many things I want to ask you about. I don't know which questions are good ones or bad ones yet, so I'm just going to jump in and Go, start asking old, you. Yeah. Um, and some of these, uh, I, I believe you hinted at, might, there might be a story behind it. But can you tell us the story about meeting Paul McCartney at Abbey oh, Road? Sure. Yeah, what, I love this What's one. that all about? This is a lovely one. Uh, I'll give you the long version. You can cut it down. Yeah, please do. Uh, I, I won't cut it down at all, I promise. <laughs> a nice segue is producer is Del Newman. The artist is a young lady, I think she was about 17 at the time, called Kate Robbins. She's in England, and we're at uh, my studio I started at, which had changed names by then to become Nova Sound. Originally, when I started it, it was recorded sound studios. But anyway, so it's now Nova Sound, and we're at 24 track, I think. Could be 16 still. But anyway, we're at the stage of doing vocals. Mm -hmm. Tracks are all done. And the artist said to Dell, the producer, you know, could we try another studio to record in just so that I can be in another studio? So he said, sure, no problem. She said, well, how about the Beatles studio? So uh, Dell said, well, you mean like Abbey Road? Like number two, which she said, yeah, well, the Beatles do their stuff. And Kate was from Liverpool. Right. So she's speaking with a Liverpool, Liverpool. accent. And uh, he said, well, I'll see when they're, they're available. So Dell went out and called Abbey Road. And uh, they had about two days ahead, they had some time. So we would have been about Tuesday, Monday or Tuesday. And uh, they had some time Thursday or something like that. And... Uh, so he said, well, we've, I've managed to book us in at Abbey Road number two, the Beatles studio, he said, for Thursday in the afternoon, we can do some vocals. So she says, great. She said, Richard will be there, right? So uh, he said, well, Richard will be there. He said, obviously, Richard's going to come. He said, but it's Abbey Road. The Abbey Road don't allow outside engineers. Oh, interesting. Uh, the only people that don't work at Abbey Road that can work at Abbey Road our previous employees, prior employees. And they're all wearing white lab coats anyway. Not by then, but oh. um, this is about 77, I guess, something like that. Now they're wearing Technicolor lab coats? <laughs> yeah, they, I think they're like probably sh still shirt and tie, but maybe not the lab coat. But anyway, so Kate said, well, I want Richard to record me. He said, well, he'll be there, you know, and he'll, but um, he just he's not allowed to touch any of the equipment. So, um, so I thought, well, that's a bit of a drag, but I knew about that. <laughs> uh, I did know, you know, as soon as she mentioned Abbey Road, I thought, well, I want to go there anyway. So I don't mind. You know. So that was that. The next day we're working, we're doing some vocals and the receptionist came into the, she said, excuse me, she said, Del, but uh, there's a phone call for, for you and uh, to Abbey Road Studios. So he goes out and he comes back in and very quickly he said, Abbey Road Studios would like to talk to you about the setup. Talk, talk to talk. you? Yeah. Yeah, great. So he said, go on, you can go and take the call. So I go outside and I did, and it's the studio manager from Abbey Road. So he said, hi, Richard. He says, Dave here. He said, um, I understand you're recording with us on Thursday. He said, uh, what can we have ready for you? I said, well, um, if you could ask the engineer. To, he said, no, no, no. He said, uh, you'll be engineering. He said, is, you know, have you got any questions you want? I said, well, is, is that okay? He said, absolutely. He said, we're, we're looking forward to you coming. I thought, this is weird. You know, so I said, well, great, you know. So I came back in and, and obviously Dell and the artist Kate had been talking about this phone call that I was about to have. So she's all beaming. She said, so how's your phone call go? So I said... It's great. I said, uh, they're, they're going to let me do the engineering. She said, oh, that's good. She said, that's wonderful. So I said, that's strange. I said, I, I was convinced that they wouldn't let outside engineers in. He's, so Dale said, well, he said, um, Kate made a call. I said, well, what do you mean? She said, well, she, she called somebody and 
they cleared the way for you. I said, well, who did she call? She said, she called her cousin. <laughs> well, well, who's her cousin? You know, Paul McCartney. <laughs> Paul called great. Abbey Road and you're in, you know? So, great. So, fast forward to Thursday and we'd done a couple of vocals and it was fun working on the, the old gear, the quadrant faders and the telefunkens and everything. And um, they, Kate and Dell decided to go to the cafeteria and uh, get a um, cup of tea. And so I left, I le left me in the room by myself to do some rough mixes to cassette for them. You know? And uh, I heard the door close, uh, them leaving the room. And the door opened again a few minutes later. And I thought maybe the assistant had come in but anyway. I carried on mixing. I, I got to the end of the song and I was, I remember pulling the faders down and a voice from behind me saying, you can press in the overheads. So I thought it was the assistant maybe, you know, inquiring as to what I was doing. And I, as I turned, I was about to say, why? There was Paul McCartney sitting with a pregnant Linda next to him. Wow. He said, hi. He said, I'm Paul. He said, you must be Richard. He said, he said, I just wondered if you were compressing. He said, sounds good. He said, I just wondered if you were compressing the overheads. That's great. And I remember think, thinking, note to self, always compress the overheads. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> apparently Paul does. So <laughs> that's, that's what I've been doing wrong all my life so far is not compressing. Anyway, so it was like, he, he, was, uh, he was great. He said, so is Kate here? So I said, they've gone to the cafeteria. He said, okay. He said, well, he said, sounds good. He said, um, I'll, I'll, we'll go to the cafeteria. We'll see you later. I said, thank you. Yeah, okay. So that was my experience of Paul McCartney. What a trip. Now, did you go on to work at um, Abbey Road often after that or, or more than that? No, only whenever I could. Only whenever you could. Yeah. Um, I got to do some work with Dave Clark in one of the other studios. I got to do, I, I worked in all the studios there on different occasions, uh, including the big one, number mm -hmm. one, which is like an aircraft hangar. Yeah. Did a 60 plus piece orchestra there. It was fun. Wow. I want to ask you about doing that. I just remembered that I thought I saw in your discography that you had worked with Scott Walker too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, do you want to tell us that story? Oh, I'm yes. a huge yeah. fan of Scott Walker 3. It's the most brilliant I probably didn't do that one. Well, I, I apologize. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. I just mean that that no, was no, sort of a discovery of his music for me. Yeah, Scott Walker. What a man. So, early 70s. Yeah. One of the albums I did with him was called Stretch. I don't know what the other one was called. But what a strange guy. He knew his voice like very few people. Knew what it was capable of and when it was capable of. And I think it was Old Grandad. Was Old Grandad and orange juice, something weird like that that was his <laughs> drink, you know. And I remember one day, Dell wasn't there, Dell was producing, and uh, Scott came in and we had some vocals planned to do. I said, so which one do you want to do first? He said, well, it doesn't matter, I can't, I can't sing yet. I, it won't match. I said, what do you mean? You know, he said, he said, no, about an hour and it'll match. Wow. I said, well, he said, we'll try if you like, he said, but it's not going to match. So we go and we do a we drop in punch in sorry, a line on a on a song, and it sounded pretty good, but it didn't sound right. Yeah, and of course he was correct. In another hour, after a couple more drinks, it was perfect. Scott was really really good. He had a fetish about never hearing his breath himself breathe on record. He didn't like to hear breaths. Yeah. So uh, as much as he would stop that, I would be encouraged to ride the fader so that I wouldn't hear a breath. You know? During a mix or during the recording? During the recording. Wow. Because there's no time in the mix. You know, there's no automation. Or yeah. Anything. And the other thing that is really weird, he was well into uh, original cast recordings on vinyl of musicals, collect collecting. The more obscure, the better. But one of the things he loved about vinyl was one of the faults of vinyl, how it can't handle S's very well, and they mm -hmm, spread right. and they go, yeah, every yes. He loved that. He would. He says, is there anything you can do to make that happen? <laughs> That's good. <laughs> the easiest thing in the world, you know. So uh, that that was another thing. And the other thing with Scott was he's apparently always 
being chased by some either husband or debt collector or something, you know. That's funny. And so uh, we'd smuggle him in and smuggle him out of the studio. And he would drive an orange left-hand drive Beetle in London. Wow. You know, you want to make your life difficult. Can you explain to the rock stars who may not know Scott Walker's music, how would you describe his music? What, 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 he, what does he do? Crooner is kind of yeah, the name that kind comes of a, to mind, right? Kind of a southern Texas crooner is a good word. Yeah, yeah. like a big... Yeah. Um, soaring vibrato too. Yeah, it's very bold vocal. Yeah. Almost, it's, it's over the top and awesome. Yeah, it's it's really good. And he was fun guy. You know, he would because he didn't like paying taxes or anything like that. So he wouldn't, and consequently, everyone was after him. You know, and he would <laughs> live in. I think he lived in Amsterdam or somewhere, and he would pop over and turn up at a working man's club and say to the boss, you know, Scott Walker give us some cash or entertain and, That's great. and go, you That's know. Um, he was also known for doing some sort of experimental approaches to music and making records. Was there some of that the way, I guess, you know, the, the granddad, old granddad and singing at the right time, that was probably part of that whole. Yeah. Approach. Who knows, you know, how much of that was a, that like we have our little blankies, our little security things, uh, sus superstitions or whatever. Mm -hmm. I don't know to what degree any of those were in that category or whether they were actually, you know, genuine recording aids. But yeah. he, um, the choice of material and how he worked musically with Dell was genuine. I mean, that's the best thing I can say. He, he was, he, he is genuine and uh, I liked him. It was the sort of music where you probably got to use the hell out of the plate reverb. Yeah, yeah. Um, or a chamber. But also learning a different sense of humor. You know, you, the British sense of humor is pretty dry, but he had uh, a, an ironic dryness. And, nice. uh, yeah, it was, it was good. He didn't suffer fools, you know. He, he, I like that. You know. Don't suffer fools. Can we make that some wisdom for the, for the rock stars? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wish. Yeah. <laughs> So, um, uh, let's, let's fast forward a little bit and, um, tell us about working with the traveling Wilburys. Mm -hmm. How did that all come about? Maybe there's a story, maybe the story needs to back up a bit before sure. to get there. I don't know. Sure. George Harrison is the pinnacle of this next segment. I worked with George once in the late seventies. Thank you, Dell. Dell was doing some string arrangements for George and Dell requested that I record the strings much apparently to the chagrin of the American engineer that ended up mixing because he didn't think I put enough level on tape. But anyway, that was in the late 70s. And then I didn't have any contact with George until 86. Uh, George was doing the music for a terrible movie called Shanghai Surprise, Sean Penn and Madonna. Mm -hmm. And Michael Kamen was doing the score the late michael came lovely man and george was doing the score at home well at home is a mansion in henley on thames right, in a right. state-of-the-art studio but it's at home and um the engineer that uh michael was using didn't appreciate the fact that the unique elements of george's studio weren't efficient or some of them very reliable, and would voice his displeasure. And uh, George didn't take well to that. Right. So the engineer was dismissed. The other thing was that they were working to uh, umatic VHS tapes and multi-track tape, uh, because this is when still really the music should be done in a music recording studio to mag you know, yeah. magnetic film. Um, George wanted to do it at his home. I see, I see, okay. It's on multi-track. I, I was afraid you were talking about the early introduction of ADATs or something. No, 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 <laughs> no, no, no. We're still ahead of that. <laughs> so it worked because most of the stuff they were recording was free form, not sync hits, you know, starts here, ends there type stuff. Right, right. But they were getting into this area where things had to hit, you know, so they needed to work to a click that had been worked out and all that sort of stuff. 
So um, I would normally have nothing to do with any of the movie stuff other than the fact that I worked with another wonderful musician, arranger, composer, producer called Mike Moran in his little home studio. And through one of the independent television companies, they'd worked out a way of syncing multi-track and VHS tape and the click. And so George, who had employed Mike on many occasions to play piano for him, called Mike and uh, said, do you know anybody, any engineers that are any good that can work with film, you know, at home? So Mike said, well, there's only one guy. He said, that's my engineer, you know, because that's the, the reference, you know, you right. called somebody's engineer. So my pet, as it were, my engineer, Richard Dodd, he said, well, do you think he'd want to come out here and help us? He said, well, I'll tell him. That, you know, so anyway, so Mike got me the gig of going to see George and kind of auditioning, you know. And as luck would have it, the equipment they had was the same as Mike had. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to use that pretty quickly. And I was able to lock up the video to the multi-track. That'll consistent. earn you a lot of friends. <laughs> you get the studio working when people really needed to, everybody will like you pretty quickly. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Being the right person at the right time. Uh, considering how this podcast started, I'm surprised you still like me at this point. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's good. It's, it's brilliant. That's the real world. So I got to work with Michael Kamen and I got to work with George and we got to work on this terrible movie with these lovely people and uh, we got through it all and it all worked and uh, everything but the movie worked. And at the end of that, George said, I'm thinking about doing a solo album in January. Would you like to be involved with that? So, you know, obviously you think for about a millisecond. Right. <laughs> and I said, yes, you yeah, know, yes, please. And so uh, I then commenced what was to be Cloud Nine. And George... Great, wonderful record. Oh, fantastic record. And George had a producer from America that I didn't know of. Um, that was recommended to him, and we commenced recording. Now, obviously, my job as engineer is to work for the artist and subsequently the producer. I didn't 100% agree with the methods that the producer wanted to use in recording George in George's studio. Um, but being a professional engineer, I saw that as a challenge and to try and make the most of what was asked of me and so I did but apparently on one occasion I must have had a look on my face that uh, spoke to George because he said uh, Are you okay Richard I said yeah I'm fine fine he said you don't seem happy I said oh no I'm really happy to be working with you he said well what's bothering you then I said you know I, I just thought it might sound different you know he goes well, don't you like the way it sounds I said, well, it's not exactly the way I th thought we could have it sounding, you know, but, you know, it's what it, he wants. He said, he said, I'm inclined to agree with you. He said, uh, it's not the sound I wanted either. Interesting. So um, this was a Friday. So come back Monday morning. And uh, I said, uh, so where is, he said, I gave him a little bit more time off. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He said, he, wow. he, he won't be coming back. I said, oh. He said, uh, we'll just work, just you and me. He said, uh, he said, till I get somebody. He said, I'm meeting somebody tonight. He said, and that may work out. So I eventually got, got him to tell me he was, he was meeting with Jeff Lynn. Yeah, right. Who I didn't know who Jeff Lynn was. I mean, I did, of course, but the name didn't ring a bell. He said, you know, ELO. So I thought, oh, okay. And then I realized who Jeff Lynn was and thought that could be interesting, you know. And so they they met and thinking, wonder what Jeff's gonna Jeff Lynn's gonna think of what I've done. He's gonna, you know, I'm out. You know, <laughs> I know if you're Jeff, like yeah, I, even though I put compressors on the overheads, I might be <laughs> done at this point. <laughs> yeah, so um I uh thought, well, 
you know, Jeff Lynn's going to hear what we've done and it's going to be really embarrassing. Uh, but anyway. I've worked out. I, and, you know, going back and listening to the record again before this interview, it was remarkable to me that the sounds are so bold on that record. They really leap out as making a statement. Yeah. I thought, you know, just the, the different sounds. I mean, everything from guitars that sounded like they might have been direct to snares that really are doing something that's almost um, yeah. electronic or something, you know? Yeah. It's, um, you know, looking back, you know, I think what we're hearing is the three of us, primarily the three of us, primarily George and Jeff and me, um, <laughs> doing the best we can under the circumstances. Um, you may think that, you know, having virtually a limitless budget, limitless time, limitless facility, that there's, you can have, you know, the sky's the limit. Right. But the best things still apply. It doesn't matter that you've got all day in theory to get the sound of one particular instrument. What matters is that they're ready what can you get now? Yeah. yeah. So many of the sounds are what you can get now or maybe what you can get now that you can probably change a little bit later. Interesting. But, you know, so it's all the same. Even with a limitless budget and limitless time, it's still down to, you know, it's been 10 minutes. Why aren't we listening back? That's great. So do you feel like maybe some of the boldness that came through on that record is – that just being in the moment and trying to capture what came when it came? I think it's all George's talent and Jeff's talent. It's Jeff pushing as far as he can to make it his way and George resisting as much as possible, saying, no, it's going to be my way. And me With a facilitating on the, on the record button ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I'm not at all responsible for the sound of that record, but I am in part, you know. There'd be no record without either Jeff or George. There would be a record without me. Interesting. You know, that's that's a given. I'd like to think that it would maybe wouldn't be as much fun without me. And I'd I'm, like I'm going to gonna think that too. Well, no, but because of the things I know that I think I did do, that I did influence... But again, it's um, you know, being the glue that keeps those two talents together and the, uh, the mass to keep them apart. <laughs> yeah. You know, because two egos like that, well earned, well deserved, but two egos like that, they sometimes clash, you know, the mountain of Muhammad, really. Well, that's, that's fascinating. And, and of course, you know, I preface this question asking about the traveling Wilburys. So we're still headed towards Sorry, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, um, but I mean, line. you talk about putting some egos together. Can you tell the rock stars who the traveling Wilburys are? It was me. <laughs> 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 exactly. no, well, there's lefty. There's, no. um, it's George Harrison and Jeff Lynn to start with. Then it was a case of them saying the traveling Wilburys, regardless of what you here on the documentaries and everything, this is what happened. Jeff and George, having imbibed in certain substances, one night decided to talk about, so if you could have anybody in your band, who would it be? And uh, the sequence of events was George, Bob Dylan. Nice. Jeff, Roy Orbison. Right. Yeah, so that's great. And then there's stories as to why. It's like picking people for for your team when yeah, everybody lines yeah, up, right? Yeah, you, know, you know, other people were mentioned, but basically it was Bob and Roy. So then we have a hiatus, you know, and they talk about it again. You know, well, what would you call your band? You know, and I remember George saying, "Well, you know, we're always we're never in the same place, so." Maybe uh, the travelers or something, you know. And the traveling, and George said, well, traveling something, you know. Then Jeff would say, well, we're getting on a bit. Maybe we should be the tremblers, you know, as in <laughs> trembling, you know, <laughs> shaking. So, um, you know, George says, no, the travelers, because we're always traveling. 
And then George, they were reading a story in the newspaper about Lady or Lord Willoughby. And that coincided with Jeff having a favorite Indian restaurant in his locale <coughs> on, I think it was like Willoughby Street or something. And he acquired the road sign, you know, the street sign. Um, but um, so the Willoughby was Wilbury, became Wilbury. It was great. But uh, that was it. Traveling, and I remember the discussion of the two L's, you know, because the Americans would want to drop one of the L's, but it had to be two L's. So he, fast forward, and now we've got Tom Petty in the band. And Yeah, I wasn't there for that originally, how, how Tom was brought in. Okay. That happened in L.A. All right. I wasn't party to that. And then that was George Jim Keltner on drums, is that right? Yeah, that's right. George tricked Bob. <laughs> um, Sounds like a nursery rhyme. Now, this is secondhand information from George and Jeff, but George asked Bob, because he wanted Bob to be, but he asked him if he could use his studio to record something. And so Bob said apparently that his studio wasn't, in proper working condition, and that's not a problem. We'll get somebody to come and sort it all out, you know. So apparently while uh, they were doing that and hanging out, Bob said, well, what are you going to do? He said, well, we're just going to sit down, write a song and record it, you know. He said, uh, well, how are you going to do that? He said, well, you know, I just look around, see if something trips my fancy and just write about it. You know, they were using Ampex 456 tape. And on the side of the boxes, they come in pairs. On the side of the box uh, is written, handle with care. That's great. You know, so George said, well, look, for example, you know, handle with care. Must be able to write a song. Unbeknownst to Bob, George had already written the song. <laughs> 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 That's great. Yeah, you know, pretty much. And so, you know, he just said, and, and of course, you could imagine Bob being impressed by George just seeing something written on a box and then come out, it's a pretty good song, you know, just like that. <laughs> and so he was encouraged to join in, apparently. And then they proceeded to, and Bill Bottrell recorded all that. Oh, great. Great engineer and producer, as you all know. But um, so that was all done, nothing to do with me. And then Don Smith, the late Don Smith, a lovely man, he worked with them at... Uh, Dave Stewart's house was then in Encino, which had a little studio and stuff. And so they would uh, track their five acoustic guitars and Jim Keltner. And they would put basic tracks down, um, write a song, record it, write That's a song, right. record it. And uh, then it all came back to England, to George's studio, where I took over, doing all the overdubs and mixing it all, with the exception of Handle With Care. I'm prou proud of the fact that George says, well, right, well, there's only one more to mix, and that's Handle With Care. And I distinctly saying, you're not going to get any better than that. You know, Bill's mix. So George said, well, you don't, you don't think so? I said, I know. That's that's perfect mix. Just leave that. So I didn't mix that one. And it's the best mix. Fascinating, wow. Yeah, so, and then the next project, after R Roy's demise, I did all of that from start to finish. We did that in L.A. and then Friar Park in England. And mm -hmm. then, Yeah. And was that your introduction to Tom Petty? Because um, we can't... Yeah, we, Tom we gotta, Petty, we gotta yeah, because Tom that, would come right? over on and do his, some overdubs and stuff. And Yeah, I mean, the best thing, going back to, you know, influence and all that sort of stuff, the, the best thing I did was help them went towards the end of the first album, it was like a case of, okay, we've got five superstars and we're all co-writing and everything. And how are we going to do the splits? Right. You know, and it started to get a bit scary, you know, because you've got five deserving artists, contributing artists. So they were in a bit of a state. So as I had a 45 minute drive there and back, I took it on myself to think, well, if that was my responsibility, how would I do it? So I formulated a formula, nice, which I presented, which as far as I know is what they used. Because I remember getting an obscure comment from Tom saying, so how did I end up writing Margarita? 
<laughs> so I explained the situation, you know, again. But um, yeah, it was it was good. That's very cool. Um, I am no expert at how to best do writer splits, but I, in my sort of indie rock mindset, I just look at it and go like, well, doesn't everybody just split everything, you know? Yeah. So let's talk about Wildflowers. Amazing sounding record. I was in school at MTSU learning how to record when that record was released. And I was I remember, in LA learning how. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember just going like, holy shit, that sounds awesome, you know, fantastic. I'm going to start putting room mics on my drums, you know. <laughs> what stories would you like to share about doing that and, and um, you know, winning the Grammy for that? How'd that feel? Fantastic. My mind went immediately to winning the Grammy. <laughs> uh, because that's where I met Jim Scott was at the Grammys ah, yeah. and Jim had done all that fantastic work including virtually mixing it mm -hmm. you know because his roughs were brilliant you know talk about a challenge trying to beat Jim Scott's rough mixes yeah equal them as a challenge but anyway so I only recorded a little bit on Wildflowers mm -hmm. a couple of the more acoustic tracks there was 23 songs in total recorded for that. And uh, we mixed them all. I think they only put 15 on the record. But, um, yeah, that was a heck of a time. I remember I had a manager at the time, and we were in L.A. I was at uh, Work Music, which is Sony, out in Santa Monica, being interviewed for a, for a job, for a mixing job. And... Uh, it was going great. It was a fantastic artist. Uh, it was a great project, and I wanted to do it. And my manager's looking at his watch. He goes, oh, Richard, um, you know, they start procedure pre-telecast, like 2 o'clock. He said, we'd be lucky to get there. We hadn't got a monkey suit or anything. Oh, this is for the, the Grammys showing yeah. up one time. Yeah, right. And uh, so I rushed back to hotel, changed the fastest I could in my life. I had a rental car. I drove there, got outside. I think it was the Shrine where they had the, and uh, I got out of the driver's seat and I handed the keys over to, uh, to Mike. I said, you go park the car, I'll see you inside. You know, this is my only shot I've ever been to the Grammys. I'm not going to miss it. And it had started. And, uh, you know, you got the award sheet, you know, and all those nominees and everything. And I'm looking at it and I thought, oh, shit. Because I could see what they've got up. And then on the list, you know, and I, thought, I missed it. So I'm trying to find someone that I can ask who got the engineer, you know, <laughs> who got best engineer. And uh, they called out because I didn't realize they did it in reverse. Oh, wow. So I, was, I hadn't missed it. And I was, and Steve Earle had just been nominated for something. And he was walking up the aisle because he didn't get it, you know, and I was commiserating with Steve when my name was called out. Wow, what a trip. Yeah. Sorry, Steve. Got to go. Got to go. Get going. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear that's yeah. great well um <laughs> that was a record that was produced by rick rubin mm -hmm. is that right and um so i remember being fortunate to be at the welcome to 1979 recording summit that you came and spoke at and you talked about mixing the record and you know talked about rick and tom working together with you and, and the whole process and normally on the on the show here we take a break and come in for the jam session questions I think maybe due to time, we'll just keep going here for a minute if you've got a, some more time, and I'll just sort of spin them sure. relative to you know mm -hmm. these records. Mm -hmm. One of the questions I like to ask is about a favorite hardware tool mm -hmm. uh, in the studio, mm -hmm. and you're sort of famous for having one in particular that we're all aware of. Do you know which one that is? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm very fond of the black-faced original 1176, Yuri 1176. Very fond. Yeah, I am too. It's a great one. In fact, it's the only compressor that I really bought for my studio is just one of those. Yeah, I peaked at 10. <laughs> at 10, okay, great. Um, another thing that, that I've heard you talk about and other people have pointed out is that um, you, know, you find a way to use them sort of everywhere and have them work really well. I, you talked about mixing wildflowers and even using a pair of them 
as your stereo mix bus compressors. Can can you we geek out a little bit and can you talk about sure. what you did for that? So it's funny that the the way the question is posed, it's like there's a little element of surprise. You know, even using I mean, at the time it was like you start with that. <laughs> okay, great. <laughs> no, I mean for me. Yeah. It's because I again referring to something I, I said earlier is expecting a performance of a piece of equipment and that one rarely let me down mm -hmm. there are occasions of course where it's totally inappropriate like when there's nothing to record right <laughs> like <laughs> but, when it's silent already <laughs> but uh you know no maybe it's my safety net it's that little edge of excitement uh, that it gives and sonic change and disturbance mm -hmm. that it gives and familiarity you know all comfortable shoes and everything but it's they're all different like great musicians they're all different but uh they're at their best when they don't know their own limitations and um, limit wasn't meant to be a pun there but the, the year is never the same it's always set the same uh, but it responds to what goes into it right and that's what i love about it it doesn't do the same thing every time except make me smile and if it doesn't there's something wrong with 1176 or something wrong with me <laughs> um that's it now that's regardless of whether we're in a digital domain or you know the non-digital domain in terms of its presence the real thing being there and of course in the digital domain now we have you know, facsimiles right. of, of that, you know, Universal Audio, for example, comes to mind. That they, they have really good plugins, and the Yuri is, is one of them. It's different from the real thing and has a, a function in, in the digital world as well. They're not the same, thank heavens. You know, there's right. yet another thing for us to use and a, a new world for me to discover in, the, in that digital world. But the Wildflowers... It was a case of uh, Jim has an affinity with the 1176 also, so they were extensively used during the recording. And the beauty of that is that the recording then sounds automatically familiar. Mm -hmm. And because it's familiar, you're comfortable. And because you're comfortable, you can be on your game. Right, good point. Yeah, and yeah, so I'm not looking like I do in so many cases when I get something to mix. It's like, how do I fix this? It's... Yeah, it's the proper question: is how do I balance this properly? Yeah, or how do I not get in the way, as you were pointing yeah, out before? Yeah, right? but you know, it's all down to balance in everything. And uh, mixing wildflowers was pretty straightforward and easy because it was recorded well. Obviously, it was played well. It was worth recording, which so often doesn't happen. Surrounded by lovely people, and the only negative was the room that I mixed in, which doesn't exist anymore. Britannia Row, that was it. And uh, 8078, Neve 8078, which I'm not a big fan of, which they're not terrible or anything, just I'm not a fan of them. But if you patch past most of it, it's great. Mm -hmm. And because it was recorded so well, I was able to patch past any most of the console. You know, So if you don't need an EQ, why have it in the way? especially if it's on an old Neve console, right. you eliminate some more transformers. You know. So there I am with some rough mixes from Jim Scott, which are already great. And we're not on Pro Tools Rockstars. We're mixing off multi-track. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah, 224 tracks locked together. 224 tracks, interesting. Well, only on some of the songs. Most of it was 24 track. Some of them, they wanted to add, add an orchestra, and there just wasn't enough tracks to facilitate that. So we'd open up maybe... Four, five. Um, were you using feet? automation or were you mixing by hand? We had automation. It was uh, Massenburg moving fader automation. And I used that on the tracks that had two multi tracks because I get, uh, Michael came and funny enough was the arranger. And Michael used to like to, during the recording, mimic small dogs barking. <laughs> in so. You know, you couldn't just leave the faders there. They had to be muted, and there's a lot of them. So the extra multi-track was brought up on the monitor side of the console little hub. So you know, I'd automate those. But the other mixes are all manual, so we got a feel for it. Yeah. And sometimes it was 
with Rick and I with fingers on the faders. Yeah. And uh, on a, maybe on a couple of occasions, Tom also. And sometimes it was a case of, okay, Richard, mix it and call us when it's ready. And I'd come in and I'd perform in front of them. Um, that's something that I remember from mixing on consoles is that experience of mixing a song and you're doing it together as a team in the room and, you're, and you've all got hands on faders and mute buttons and it's a performance and you get to the end and then you all either feel great about it or you don't and then you listen back and you hope to be excited. Do you miss that sort of mixing experience? Do you think there are ways for us to recreate that these days with the digital world? Or is that sort of a, a, a method of bygone times? That's one of the questions I wish I had an answer for. Even the personal element of it, of do I? I don't know. I was him then when I was enjoying everything you just spoke of. I was him. Now I'm me. Right. Because I had the energy and the mental retention to enjoy all that, you know, to remember what seemed like a thousand moves and switches and all that over four minutes and or more and get them all, wow. nail it, you know. I can barely remember my name now, you know. <laughs> it's um, <laughs> it's, it, it's Richard Dodd, by the way. Yeah, I know, but uh, is it? Okay. Um, I rely on my computer to recall what I expect it to recall and my notes, my email and all that sort of stuff. Whereas, you know, I used to be much more alert. And so I was in sync with the time, my age, I was in sync with the times. Now I could do, you know, a manual mix now and I'd probably be pretty good at it, but I wouldn't be stimulated to, okay, let's go. I'd be more like, oh, shit, so how's this going to go, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Honey, I don't think I'm going to be home for dinner tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, um, yeah, I think I'd be a, a lot of autopilot, you know. If it doesn't need that little nudge there, I probably wouldn't try to remember to do it. Right. I would rely on my instinct only rather than recall. I miss the hell out of doing it, I think, you know, but I don't. You know, where was auto-tune when I had to sit there for days with a person with no talent trying to get a verse? Yeah, yeah, really. You know, for something that no one's going to hear anyway. Yeah. You know? So, but, you know, uh, dropping in a thousand times, doing amazing punch-ins and punch-outs seamlessly on gear that can't wishing, do it. Wishing somebody was watching you do it. Yeah, no one's ever going to hear it. <laughs> you know, never going to get heard. Whereas, you know, don't, they don't even think about it now. We never had, you know, undo. We had redo. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, uh, well, let's go back to the 1176 for just a sec. Sure. Um, you've used it in a lot of different ways. Um, can you share with the rock stars maybe three examples of ways that you might use it on different instruments? What are some good starting points that people sure. might try? Good starting point. Ratio set to 20 to 1. The attack set to its slowest, the release set to its fastest, and then uh, switch the meter to uh, register gain reduction, uh, and then adjust input and output accordingly so that the gain reduction is about an inch and the output isn't too much. The gain reduction is about an inch. I yeah. love it. Yeah. That's the kind of metering we're talking about. Yeah. That's yeah. rock and roll. Yeah, inch or <laughs> inch and a half, you know, depends on... What, what what you're doing. Then, the only tip I can give from then is if that doesn't sound right, move the microphone. Wow. Move it away. Move the microphone further away from the source. And uh, if necessary, crank the input back up again. <laughs> but, um, you know, pretty much every 1176 I've ever worked on has found the output control stuck in one position. It's hardly needed but uh the input's gone up and down a few times and of course there are values there are times when the other ratios come into play more complex program material 
sometimes requires or benefits from a slightly less or radically less ratio. Uh, and of course, then you've got the all buttons in thing, you know, which I've tried a million times and maybe twice liked, uh -huh. you know, and right. thank you for those two times. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's just a wonderful device. For me, it's uh, my ear simulator. Tends to give me an access to what my ear is going to do under real world circumstances. In other words, it minimizes the restricting elements of a, of a microphone mm -hmm. and changes it into an ear for me. Awesome. I like that. You know, it's. Um, and a, a, a quick tip for any novices is if in doubt where to put the microphone, never put a microphone where you wouldn't put your ear. Right. Fair enough. You know, start with that principle. And if it sounds good where you're standing, maybe consider micing it from there. You know, little novice things. And we all know that's not a rule of thumb, but um, it's, a, it's a good place to start. Yeah. I love that I asked the 1176 question because your answer is way different than I might have expected, which mm. is great. I love that, you know, the 20 to 1 ratio is a great place to start and go take a listen to on anything to begin with. Um, and I have to confess that I've always been stuck on the 4 to 1 ratio and I rarely or never go to the 21 ratio. So I got to go remix all my records now. Like, yeah. I just doubled my career. Yeah. It's great. I think there's, is it the Spectrosonics has got 30 to one? Oh, the Spectrosonics is That's awesome. 10 more. <laughs> and 11. I discovered at somebody else's prompting on a session a while back to just take the input knob and jack it all the way up. And I did it for a very distorted kind of vocal sound that was fantastic on some of the right stuff. I mean, it, Jeff Walker wouldn't have liked it because you get a lot of breathing when you do that. <laughs> but, Scott, yeah. I mean, Scott Walker. Yeah, too. I know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it just it's such a cool, it's a, it's a great piece of gear and it's a lot of fun to mess around with. And I think that a good takeaway for you rock stars is just a reminder, once again, that some of the best stuff you're going to discover with any of your gear, I think, is you got to break out of your whatever limiting belief you have about it and start pushing things yeah, to extreme places. I, I mean, early on in this, if you if you've left it in, I was talking about my very first tape machine experience and discovering a, what was on this particular machine a knob on the front panel called bias. You know, no idea what it was. Turn it. You weren't afraid to turn it all the way to the left and all the way to the right. Well, how else do you know what it does? You know? <laughs> exactly. It's um, it yeah. I mean, you can read about it. You can listen to somebody tell you about it. Or you can do it. Do it. That's, That's great. You can't really say that there are times where you should think like input and output suggestions. Yeah. You know, there are times when they're absolute. You know, you don't stick your th tongue into the power socket ever. <laughs> you don't do that. And How about checking a nine volt battery? Is that cool? That's an experience. <laughs> <laughs> if the battery's good, it's a fantastic experience. Uh, if it's flat, it's a relief. You know. Um, yeah. I mean, unfortunately, one of the things that's helped me is in the digital world with plugins. I'm immensely grateful to Universal Audio for providing me with the means to keep some of my older software making me money because of the UA plugins operating on that platform have expanded the life beyond anyone could have conceived of it being possible. Uh, so I'm very grateful to that. But what I've learned not to do is expect anything from a plugin. I learn my plugins. You should not expect a black picture of a blackface 1176 to perform the way the hardware piece does. Right. That's, I made that mistake early on because I would say, regardless who made the plugin, I would compare the plugin to the real thing. And if it didn't match up, and none of them do, you know, I, I dissed it. It's rubbish, which was wrong on my part because what I needed to do was find out what it did do. Right. Learn that and appreciate that. That's what the kids do. That's what the kid with the bias knob does. 
Well, sure, yeah. I mean, because he doesn't already know that he doesn't like it. Exactly. Or that it's wrong, yeah. you know. So I l love these plugins for what they can do. And there's still some plugins that I think I've pretty much tried and they're still rubbish. <laughs> okay, well, we don't have to talk about those ones. No, 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 no. no How no. about some favorite Universal Audio plugins, stuff that you are excited about or new ones or, or okay. something Okay, like um, Cambridge EQ. Okay. Is this the... Um, is that the same one that was modeled after the Sony Oxford console? Probably. Okay. Probably. I don't know. Okay, I, I could be off on that. Um, a nice little tip. Sorry, John. I'm going to tell him. It's a very good EQ, but there is one element on there that is devastatingly good. There's a high-pass filter selection, and at the bottom of the list is the word elliptical, I think. Anyway, it's at the bottom of the list. Now, that is the most wrong high-pass filter you can come across. It's fantastic. Because what it doesn't do is nicely prune the bottom end of any given frequency. It slices it off with a very rusty saw, <laughs> you know? And so consequently, you have a new sound. And a new sound with more room than you've ever had before. You know, so actually you're chopping off bottom. And it, it's the case anyway, but it's very obviously adding a color, which is fabulous. Yeah. In a completely different way that the Helios plugin changes the sound in a remarkably fun way. You don't need to you just employ the Helios plugin. You just select the frequency on the low end, the 60 hertz frequency, and stand back in amazement. <laughs> Just yes. like the real thing. It's, um, you're not going to get that sound any other way. That makes that beautiful, a wonderful plugin. Then there's the element that I really enjoy is when they've modeled something really well, like uh, Fairchild 660. Now, not only have you then got a mono device that you can use in stereo or <laughs> whatever, uh, so it's something that does exist. They've enhanced it in UA's case by adding a side chain high pass filter into the side chain. That doesn't exist on the real thing. Do you know how useful that is? <laughs> Little tip if you want to try, you've got a recorded voice. Obviously, somebody else has recorded it, not you. And it's really hard and nasally and horrible. Well, if you put the 660, and you turn that high pass filter all the way up, which gets to around 500 hertz, you're effectively now not processing anything below 500 hertz. Mm. So subsequently, you can attack all that nasty stuff, compress it or whatever, control it, make it less peaky, and still leave some of the good stuff natural, au naturel, yeah. as it were. There you go. You now have the widest deessa, the de eh -er, you know? the de <laughs> <laughs> you know, And you, you don't have to use the 670 to do that, but you can learn by using that 660 with the high-pass filter in the side chain. You can learn, oh, I can do that, can't I? So any limiter that I own that has the facility of a side chain, I can put an EQ in there and now turn it into a de -er rather than a de -er. <laughs> That's great. You know? I like it by either using a filter or by emphasizing the thing you don't like on the side chain and making those the uh, focal point of the control for the limiter. So let me ask you this question about software. Uh, obviously, you've had tons of experience with tape, good tape, bad mm -hmm. tape. Mm -hmm. You know what mm -hmm. it's all about. And mm -hmm. you know that plugins aren't going to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Do you find that plugin emulations of tape have been really useful to you fantastic. And, and remain so. Absolutely fantastic. Um, for example, there's the, the UA uh, 102, Ampex 102 tape machine. Now, that tape machine, one I've got anyway, and the plugin has four speeds, simulates four speeds, one of which is three and three quarters. Now, you can't go to the real thing and accept that what happens when you put your program through three and three quarters it's terrible because it wows it's as noisy as hell and 
you know, it just ruins the sound. There's something cool about it, but you can't use it because of all the negatives. Well, all those negatives, you can bypass on that plugin. (laughs) (laughs) You can choose not to have any noise. You can choose to not have any wow and flutter. And you can record at such a low level that your signal to noise would have been ridiculous. But now here it is. It's fantastic. You know, so you have a facility of something you could never hear before. It's um, Elvis double tracked. You know, it's not there. Yeah. What are some typical places that you might reach for the tape emulator plug-in when you're mixing or mastering? On the two mix. Okay. Because I want a little bit of compression, a little bit of EQ, but I don't know what I want. So I put the tape on there and mess with the bias and uh, the level, the type of tape, the size of the head, and just go through and see if there's something there that, I like, you know, it's a box of chocolates. <laughs> nice. nice. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, um, yeah, it's, and I'll do that after I like the mix because nothing like that's ever going to save your mix, but, you know, put a nice little bow on it maybe and wrap it up, you know. I like it. So uh, if you come out with your own signature tape plug in one day, you heard it right here, rock stars. I'm suggesting that you might want to call it the box of chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, yeah, I, I have a little secret box of my own called the Motone, and which I tried to put into production, but I can't make them yet to high enough standard to be, you know, reproduced on, on mass, as it were. Uh, so there's uh, four in existence. I have the original. And uh, my friend Vance Powell has the next best one. And and John McBride bought the other two. No, John doesn't have one. <laughs> John doesn't have any of them. Reed Chippin has oh, one. Yeah. Has one of the Reed, prototypes. Reed was a classmate of mine. Yeah, and uh, the best engineer probably Dan Rudin. Okay, great. Yeah, I hate Dan Rudin. <laughs> <laughs> He's design studios he records he produces he mixes he fixes the gear he composes the material and uh he plays everything too you know and he's funny I hate Do, him. does he co-write everything as well uh i he's composing some of the stuff he's doing now for disney very cool I'll yeah have to, uh, he's got if, a fabulous studio see if oh, he'll join me on the podcast God. you should yeah he's funny He's really um, funny. Well, Richard, uh, we're winding down here. We've been going for a good long stretch. Let me ask you a couple more questions, mm-hmm. and then we'll wrap up. You've been doing this for a long time professionally. Mm-hmm. You didn't choose to do it as a hobby. In fact, when you first started recording, you said you had no hobbies. Mm-hmm. What advice do you have for the rock stars about the business side of doing music? I mean, you've seen a, a real arc and changes in the music industry. What would you like to tell people who are either doing it or just starting out? Well, one of the subjects I'm often asked about in contact with your question are the schools for recording. And you know, any school is good, as far as I'm concerned. And sometimes the subjects aren't appropriate for schools. Sometimes that's the only way you're going to learn anything. What I've come to realize is that many of the people that go into learning our job and go through the college school system, probably had what it takes before they started the course. And subsequently, many that go into those courses don't have what it takes. I would suggest that you really find out if you have it before you go further. You can almost discover, just by asking yourself some questions, whether you have it or not. You know, for example... What else is life worth living for? <laughs> right. you know, if there's another option, then you haven't got it. <laughs> do you know anything that's more interesting? If you do, then you probably haven't got it. Um, would you give up with only one scratch on your cube? Yeah. Or would you keep going? Yeah. It's um, it's not knowing your limitations. You know, not not knowing how much you actually. If you, you can find yourself in a situation as I have so many times, leaving a session and pinching myself thinking, 
and I get paid for this. Right. You know, it's like, and then realizing that you've heard stuff that no one's ever, ever going to hear because it wasn't saved, because it was a rehearsal, yeah, because it was erased. Because um, it was on a playlist. Because apparently yeah. <laughs> it wasn't good enough. You know, we can do it better. And really what they're doing is different in many cases. If you can realize that having to go to sleep is a real pain in the neck, because that means you're not working, then you have got it. You've got it big time. It's, um, it's more important than your personal will. It's above catering for your client, your artist, you know, making sure it all works is more important than any material thing, any other material thing, without a doubt. Sometimes it can be more important than getting paid. That usually comes back to frustrate you a little later, but... Oh, yeah. The, you've got to learn to say no. I haven't said that already. Uh, the value of saying no is incredible. If you overthink things, you've literally done that. You've overthought it. It's too late. You can't unthink it. Um, you need to go in with your eyes open and expect to be screwed. But hopefully there'll be something great that you learn from that that will be of value to you one day. And every one of those experiences, good and bad, is a stepping stone to where you are. If you don't like where you are, you haven't stepped on enough stones yet. Yeah, or you've just chosen the wrong path. I think there were about 10 tweetable quotes in what you just said there. <laughs> That's great. I don't tweet. So. <laughs> <laughs> I do it reluctantly. <laughs> sorry, Rockstars. I just want to get the episodes out to you. Yeah. I, um, sorry about that. As, as well, you'll notice that I don't have any social media thing. Well, we'll get to your website here in a sec for sure. But let me let me jump to the last question for you. Yeah. This is hypothetical, but we're going to take the Wayback Studio machine mm -hmm. and you're going to go back and find young Richard, tap yourself on the shoulder and you turn around, young Richard turns around surprised and you say, you know, I've come to give you this bit of advice. Here's the single most important thing you need to know to be a rock star of the recording studio mm -hmm. one day. What advice would you give yourself? Don't move out of the frame. Is the frame some British reference to living in your parents' basement? No, unfortunately. <laughs> I was the guy that would always say, hey, no, 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 I'll take the picture. You guys can stand there, I'll take the picture. Come on, Rich, come over here. No, no, I'll take the picture. You know, I made myself as invisible as possible because got, I got the most done. I was the person that had a great idea but knew that the only way to get that idea implemented was to give the credit to somebody else. If you got a dumb enough producer, you could say, you know what you're saying earlier about, maybe that would work. <laughs> I said that. I think you did. You know, okay. and, uh, you know, just getting your ideas and manipulating, I guess that's terrible, isn't it? But that's what I did. And by the same token, I'd also be as invisible as possible. So hopefully people are less inhibited by somebody they can't see. Yeah. Well, yeah. I imagine on the one hand that opened certain doors for you. Sure. I'd worked with people for years and they didn't even realize I was smoking next to them. <laughs> you smoke? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because so there's a way of smoking without annoying people. Well, when everybody, you know, in those days. You know, yeah. Obviously, I don't smoke now. I haven't done for a long, long time. Good call. 25 years. But... um yeah, I mean, there's those that smoke and want people to see him smoking and those that smoke because they couldn't breathe in the room because other people smoking, so they've yet to join in, you know? But You've, take pictures, document your life. You're going to be a star. It'd be nice to have all that stuff to look back on. I've got these memories and they're fading. I think you basically hit the nail on the head. That's why I created this podcast because, you know, we're the rock stars of the recording studio and... I wanted you to have a chance to be the one in, in the frame, you Thank know, you. be in focus. Thank you. <laughs> I'm glad pleasure. you haven't got a camera. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, where's my phone? I'll take a picture before we get out. Richard, thank you so much for joining us on Recording Studio Rockstars. 
It's been an absolute honor and a pleasure yeah. to hang out with you. And thanks it's for fun. your patience as we got this the recording rig actually set hey, up. Hey, it's the real world. I love all that. You know, that's <laughs> what happens. Um, they, the, the listeners don't know what happened to us, but um, they're going to experience it. Yeah. Make backups, guys. Make backups indeed. And document. Tell the rock stars how they can learn more about you and find you on the internet. Uh, listen to your podcast. Excellent. That's about it. Um, you have a website. I do, but there's nothing on it. There's nothing on it. No. I disagree. There's a great discography on there. No, a good website is Dan Rudin's website because he's got everything on it. And if I could, I'd have one like that. But um, yeah, I'm a private person and I put as little as I possibly can out there i have a facebook page but it's blocked even i'm blocked from that. <laughs> that's great that's great <laughs> well in uh, in the respect of your your uh inclination to step out of the frame i will uh, i will mention it for you rockstars richard dodd.com i believe is the website d-o-d-d -D. so go check it out and you can see the amazing discography there um well, thank you for being on the show there's so much to talk about i feel like we might need to see if I can convince you to make this a yearly episode and we'll just sure. reconvene. Yeah, it's fun. I mean, I, I you prompted me to remember some fun, fun things and uh, I'm amazed at how much we haven't spoken about, you know, that uh, could actually be interesting. Yeah, you know, indeed. It's, uh, I don't it's, think we got past, you know, 1995 or something, right? That's right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a long, it's been a long time. It's, it's fantastic. It's a great job, guys uh, and girls. It's, uh, it's a fantastic job. But go searching. Be curious. Definitely. That's the way to do it. And step into the frame. Oh, yeah, please. Yeah, don't look back on the way I will be, you know. I mean, I don't regret any of it other than the fact that I can't prove it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, it's, I like uh, it. It, was, it wasn't even a figurative suggestion. It was literal. It was like be in the pictures. Yeah. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it, it's absolutely, great. yeah. I'm not smart enough to be anything else. That's <laughs> great. All right. Well, Richard, thank you. And uh, I look forward to seeing more of you around the studio. Thank you very much. All right. Cheers. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text RS Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's RS Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lyd Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.